Hello and welcome back to another breaking news update. My name is Jimmy Boyd and you were watching Boyd News. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm back with some more updates coming out from the Russian-Ukraine war. I've got a ton of things that have transpired over the last 24 hours that I have to share with you. We'll talk a little bit about the Kursk region here today. And we've got some other events that have been just going on in the last four or five hours inside of Russia. We'll also talk about some updates in regards to the Marinovka airfield in the Volgograd region that came under attack just yesterday. So lots and lots of big attacks taking place here in Russia in the last 24 hours. We even have some updates regarding that oil depot in the Rostov region. That thing is still burning. What has it been about six days later? Still burning. And uh, it apparently actually came under attack again by Ukrainian drones. So we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So in regards to the Kursk region, we don't have any crazy updates as of yet, but we still know that they've taken at least 94 settlements inside of the Kursk region of Russia, also controlling at least 1,250 square kilometers. And what's also being reported is they could be up to 1,300 square kilometers of land taken in the Kursk Oblast just in the last 24, 48 hours. So it looks like they are still moving um, inside the Kursk region, but it definitely seems like the Ukrainians are starting to stall out a little bit. We heard from the uh, commander of the Akhmat Special Forces fighting on behalf of Russia. These are the Chechen army. Uh, they are reporting, their commander said that they basically were, were taking control of the situation and starting to stop this offensive from the Ukrainians. And we definitely are starting to see that. We're not hearing as much information coming out from the Kursk region showing that Ukraine is pushing more and more into this region. So this video that you're watching here is a uh, the Ukrainian forces putting up yet another Ukrainian flag in the Kursk region. So we're continuing to see that as well. So definitely more settlements are starting to fall into the hands of the Ukrainian forces. So I've got lots of information to jump into today. So let's go ahead and head on over to X. I've got numerous reports coming out here. So this just came out yesterday. I actually put a community post for you guys here on YouTube. If you didn't see that, I shared this with you yesterday for Max24. The United States is not against Ukraine's counterattack with U.S. weapons in Kursk and Sumy regions. This is Sabrina Singh. She is the press secretary for the Pentagon, and she came out and said this just yesterday. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, United States is not against Ukraine's counterattack with U.S. weapons in Kursk and Sumy regions. This means that Ukraine has permission to use attackums and HIMARS inside of the Kursk region and Sumy regions where a lot of the fighting has taken place because obviously this offensive has opened up, right? So we just had some video footage coming out from Glushkovo just a few days ago showing some pontoon bridges coming under attack like cluster munitions. And I talked to you guys about that. And I was wondering if these were maybe attackums that were striking that. Well, I found out apparently HIMARS can also be fitted with cluster munitions. So it was most likely HIMARS that struck uh, these pontoon bridges. It might have not been attackums. But uh, definitely the Ukrainians do have permission to use uh, longer range weapons, even the HIMARS, which is not extremely long range, but they are allowed to use these inside of the uh, Kursk offensive going on in the Kursk Oblast. So very, very big news. And again, like I've been telling you guys, this is going to be a slow tiptoe process where Ukraine is going to be able to go deeper and deeper and deeper into Russian territory with U.S. made weapons. And we're starting to see that right now. And this is the beginning of it. So uh, like I said yesterday in the community post, hold on to your pants, ladies and gentlemen, because it's about to get wild and crazy over here very soon once we start to hear that Ukrainians can now strike these airfields inside of Russia, wherever they want to. It's coming. At some point, they're going to be able to do this. And I think that's the whole part of this Kursk offensive is to allow Ukraine to strike deeper and deeper into Russian territory. So I thought that was absolutely huge news. Let's move on to the Kursk region now. From Tendar, this came out today. Ukrainian forces in the, in the Kursk region took three more villages backed by visual evidence. Uh, Ruskaya, Konopelka, the village of Kornevo, not to be confused with the town Kornevo. Apparently there's a village called Kornevo and also a major town called Kornevo. And Krasno uh, Kit Kitabursko, I don't know how to say that's a, such a hard name, sorry guys, are now under AFU control with the last village. It is now confirmed that Russia south of the same river can only withdraw crossing this river, okay? So we heard about this yesterday, but apparently they are taking some more uh, smaller uh, villages and settlements getting closer to Glushkovo, okay? So 
basically in the last 24, 48 hours, we kind of heard this information that this town right here that's really hard to pronounce, Krasno Kitsabursko, I'm going to say it like that, is a town very close to the same river that runs along right here on over to Gloshkovo. So essentially the Russians cannot move south of this river no more. They actually have to cross this river, the same river up here in the north, and then have to cross again to get to Gloshkovo and some of these other uh, settlements that are over here in this land that we've been talking about, this territory of 700 square kilometers. Once the Ukrainians start to push more west over here, they're going to be able to take control of that if they're able to. It'll push their numbers up to 2,000 potential square kilometers that they could be taken over in the uh, Kursk region if they are successful in this operation. So we've been talking a lot about this region over here recently. So also from Ukraine battle map, Kursk battle map, August 23rd, 1400 hours. Ukrainian forces control to 94 settlements and at least 920 square kilometers up to 1300 square kilometers of land in the Kursk region. Over the past week, Ukraine has expanded its control by around 200 square kilometers in Kursk. Ukrainian forces are now 17 kilometers from Elgov. Okay, so here's an updated map of the uh, the fighting that is ongoing in the Kursk region right now. So last we heard too, Kornevo, this is the town of Kornevo. I heard it was actually under control, but it might still be uh, contested by the Russians at this time. But definitely the Ukrainians are starting to expand more westward. And we've been talking about this all this yellow that's starting to open up here. The Ukrainians definitely are trying to push forward towards the Glushkovsky district, but we don't have any more updates from the uh, Glushkovsky district at this time. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep moving here. Here's a photo coming out from Vicegrad 24. The 22nd Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian Army captured another large group of Russian soldiers in the Kursk region of Russia yesterday. So here's a photo that came out to show you guys. So once again, more pictures and video footage that we've been showing you almost every single day of more Russian troops being captured in the Kursk region and taken as prisoners of war. They will be heading back to Ukraine very soon. And I can't believe Ukraine has even enough space to house all these Russian soldiers that have been captured. I mean, they've definitely captured hundreds, uh, potentially upwards of 500 or more inside of the Kursk region recently. So that was a pretty cool picture to see this coming out. So let's go ahead and keep moving here. From Nexta, India is ready to actively con contribute to peace in Ukraine, says Modi. So the uh, Prime Minister of India, Modi, came to uh, came to Kiev recently here in the last 24 hours, and it says India offered to mediate between Zelensky and Putin. Four bilateral cooperation agreements were also signed. Okay, so India doing some business with uh, with Ukraine, and also at the same time they want to contribute to allowing peace between Russia and Ukraine. So this is some big news. Hopefully uh, hopefully we can start getting some mediators in this war and start putting an end to this conflict at some point soon. But I've got some information to show you guys pretty soon as well that uh, we we're probably going to see this war continuing on, especially if elections in the United States go a certain way. Okay, so we'll talk about that as we move forward. So also, now we're going to be talking about the Marinovka airfield. I've got some reports coming out showing the devastation here at this airfield in the Volgograd region. So Noel reports, recent satellite images reveal the damage caused by uh, to the Russian Marinovka Air Base by Ukrainian attack. The photos show the base before and after the attack with fuel and ammunition explosions causing visible fire damage up to two kilometers away from the impact site. Ukrainian officials have not commented on the attack while Russian military bloggers claimed that all operational aircraft had left the base prior to the strike and those that were damaged were not flight-worthy due to missing parts and engines. So from what we're hearing from the Russians, it looks like they were able to move most of their aircraft off the airfield uh, before the strike took place. So we have not heard any, any confirmation of any Su-34s, Su-24s, or any strategic bombers that were located at this base that were destroyed, but we can see from the satellite imagery, look at the amount of territory that was burned. Uh, it looks like two kilometers away from the airfield was actually burned once this fire got going. So it was definitely a massive, massive fire at this airfield. And again, I will show you guys some of the damage. You can even kind of see some of the hangars over here that were destroyed. There was at least four or five of them over here that were destroyed and multiple other areas that had apparently glide bombs at this airfield as well were also destroyed. That's why we had such massive fires and major explosions, secondary explosions going off as well. 
was many glide bombs were apparently stored here at this airfield as well. So we got some pictures now from Max 24. Consequences of a drone attack on the airfield Marinovka in the Volgograd region. So we've got some pictures coming out here too. So we can clearly see some of the hangars here that were destroyed. It might be a little hard to see for you guys. It is a little uh, bit of a small photo, but we can see several of these hangars. Uh, these two look flattened right here. We've got two more that were damaged and a hole in that one. So we'll have some up-close photos here as well. So check this out also. If we look at the top of this hangar that was uh, destroyed here, look at all the pellets that punctured through this uh, this hangar as well. Okay, and Take a look at this photo also. As well, this one showing complete damage to this hangar also. And uh, look at this. So somebody took a picture of a pellet in their hand showing that some of the uh, munitions that were being used were some sort of uh, shrapnel munitions that were launching pellets all over the place and that explains why we see all these holes here inside of this uh, the, of this hangar. So this is probably ammunition that was purposely used to do as much splash damage as possible to the aircraft that were stored here at this facility, assuming that there were aircraft here at the time that were damaged. Again, we don't have any information as of yet whether any of their uh, fighter bombers or aircraft that were here at this facility were hit. But definitely the munitions that they chose to use were designed to do as much splash damage as possible to damage these aircraft at these facilities. So also, Ukraine battle map reports some devastating destruction from Marinovka Air Base in Russia after last night's attack by Ukraine. Ukrainian drones destroyed multiple hangars and ammunition depot and support vehicles. The base, 400 kilometers from the front, housed 14 Su-24s and 15 Su-34s. Okay, so take a look at these pictures here. We've got uh, several satellite imagery that shows some of the damage. So we can clearly see these hangars over here being destroyed. Look at all this fire. Looks like if there was any aircraft here, look at all the fire that was burning on this uh, this portion of the airstrip. And we can just see all the charred areas on the airstrip everywhere. It looks like there's a few uh, Su-34s over here, actually. And we've got some fire here. So if there was aircraft stationed here, on these, uh, these runways, they definitely got hit. But again, we don't have any confirmation of that yet. Maybe we will at some point soon. There's even some damage over here to some storage warehouses that were in this area. So we'll have some zoomed in pictures now as well. So this photo right here, up, up here is this section down here. Okay, so this is what it looked like prior. These are all the hangars. There's the SU-34s that are stationed over here on this side that were there previously, and the hangars, there was one, two, three, four, at least right here that were destroyed for sure. This one's got a huge hole in it. And then also over here, we've got uh, some storage inside of this uh, facility here also that was completely destroyed. I mean, look at that, it's all black. Whatever this building was that was right here is completely gone. Just absolute devastation across this airfield. I mean, I showed you guys yesterday that video footage, absolutely insane, the amount of damage that was being taken place. And we also saw more drones crashing, more secondary explosions happening in that video as well. So definitely a massive, massive attack at this airfield. Here's some more pictures, up close imagery showing these hangars being destroyed. I mean, just look at this, all these buildings back here gone and uh, an up close of a uh, photo of the storage facilities right here once again that we could see completely gone and destroyed, okay? So again, what was being reported that I heard from some other reports on X that glide bombs were also being stored at this airfield. So if these glide bombs went off, that's also going to create some massive fireballs and uh, insane amounts of damage. And we are definitely seeing that, okay? So I don't think all of this was caused by drones. It was probably secondary explosions from missiles, glide bombs, things like that that were stored at this airfield. Okay, so also, we had some major news that came out. We're going to go ahead and go full screen here. This happened in the Volgograd region as well of Russia just in the last maybe six hours, okay? Take a look at this on Reuters. Russian snipers kill Islamist hostage takers to end prison siege. So apparently there was a prison, I think it was called IK-19 or number 19 in the Volgograd region that was taken over by four prisoners that were supposedly representing themselves as Islamic, Islamist uh, state uh, members. And they, they took over this prison. There was like at least... Uh, eight of the guards that were taken prisoner and four 
of the uh, of of other prisoners that were staying here at this facility as well. They were all taken hostage, and this went on for a number of hours. And we also had some of the staff that was, uh, unfortunately, they were stabbed and killed in this event as well. So it was a very major, uh, I would consider it a terrorist attack um, inside of the Volgograd region of Russia. So let me go ahead and share some of this information with you. We're just going to go briefly over this real quick, and then I've got some stuff on X to show you. So it says Russia security services shot dead four inmates on Friday who had taken hostages at a penal colony, fatally stabbed four of its staff, and posted online videos describing themselves as Islamic State militants, officials said. Snipers of the Special Forces of the Russian National Guard in the Volgograd region, with four precise shots, neutralized four prisoners who had taken prison employees hostage. Okay. Also, the hostages have been released, state news agency RIA quoted, the National Guard is saying. The Federal Prisons Service said all four attackers had been liquidated. It said four of its staff had died of stab wounds and others have been treated in the hospital. A total of eight prison employees and four convicts have been held hostage, it said. In one of the videos posted by the attackers, victims were seen lying in pools of blood, one of them with his uh, throat slashed. One of the prisoners shouted that they were, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, I think it's Mujahideen of Islamic State, okay? So they were representing themselves as, uh, as uh, Islamic State members, and uh, they took control of this prison for a number of hours until basically... The special forces came in and took them out uh, in the Volgorad region, Russian special forces that was. So we have a video here. Unfortunately, I can't show you. It's going to be too graphic. But from Special Kursan uh, Kat, a group of Islamic State terrorists has seized the IK-19 prison in Surovikino, Volgograd Oblast, Russia. Several Russian Federal Penitentiary Service officers have been killed and several more are being held hostage. So also... From Bliskovka, prisoners who took hostages could buy knives on the territory of the colony. Employees sold them for 3,000 rubles, according to Russian mass media. They also threatened to use an improvised explosive device. Those who seized the colony said that management of the institution oppressed Muslim prisoners. Okay, we've got a picture here of one of the uh, Islamic State members that were inside of this prison at the time when they took control of this. He took a picture of himself holding up what appears to be an Islamic State flag an ISIS flag. So uh, very crazy what happened here, guys. I think this went on for about four or five hours, maybe longer. And apparently they were also demanding uh, to get like, I think it was like 3 million rubles or something like that. And they also wanted a helicopter to try to get out. But apparently they were denying those claims that they did not want a helicopter. But take a look at this as well from the informant. The road to IK-19, which is the prison, captured by terrorists in the Volgograd region, was blocked by the Russian authorities. Three federal penitentiary service employees were killed and several others were injured during the hostage taking at IK-19. The head of the Volgograd 19 penal colony, 45-year-old Andrei Devyatov, is in the ICU. He managed to escape the invaders. Along with him are four prison guards and a prisoner. The kidnappers in the Volgograd colony demand two million in a helicopter. Uh, there are a total of 1,230 prisoners in the colony. So my mistake, two million uh, rubles is what they wanted and a helicopter to escape uh, but uh, clearly that was not the case no helicopter came and they were taken out by special forces but as we can see in this video we're not going to watch the whole thing but we can see some uh, some of these police officers guarding one of the roads that leads to the uh, prison that was being taken over by these uh, Islamic State uh, members that took control of the prison, okay? So very, very crazy news. Also, from next to ISIS, supporters who captured prison, number 19 in Sorovkin, uh, Sorovikin, excuse me, said they were taking revenge for the terrorists who attacked Crocus. So Crocus City Hall, I reported on that months back when the Crocus City Hall inside of Moscow was attacked by what appeared to be uh, ISIS members, and we had like dozens and dozens of people that were unfortunately killed in that event. It was a major, major terrorist attack in Moscow, one of the first in a very long time. And it says here they deny that they demanded $2 million and a helicopter. One of the terrorists claim that they still have many hostages, although they're not seen in the video. So there was a picture here of two of them. They were in uh, looked like what, be, what appeared to be an outside portion of the facility. They also had a guard that uh, was unfortunately, he was full of blood and he was injured. They had him tied up and uh, they were recording a video talking about themselves, why they were doing this. Uh, but this appears to be some sort of affiliation with ISIS when this uh, terrorist attack took place at the prison.
Okay, and also from next to just end, special forces have eliminated four prisoners in the captured uh, in a captured prison near Volgograd as a result of an assault. Uh, Rosga Vardia reported the assault reportedly lasted 30 minutes. The hostages were released. So we got a 19 second video. It just kind of shows some of the Russian special forces that showed up took it uh, took control of the situation. So just go ahead and take a look at this. So Russia definitely has been dealing with a lot of terrorist attacks recently. We have this one. We had one not too long ago. Uh, it was in another district very close to Volgograd too. I think it was on the southern portion of Russia as well. Some sort of mosque got attacked as well by, uh, so I believe, if I'm correct, it was some ISIS members as well. And then we also had the Crocus City Hall not too long ago, just several months back, coming under attack as well. Uh, which was another terrorist attack. So definitely a lot of terrorism going on in Russia right now that I wanted to share with you. So we're going to go ahead and move on here now. Also from Nexta, as a result of the hostage taking in, in prison, number 19 in the Volgograd region, four employees of the prison were killed. According to the Federal Penitentiary Service, the criminals were four. Uh, were four. They took eight employees of the prison and four prisoners hostage. Four employees were immediately stabbed. Three of them died. Another four resisted and were hospitalized. One of them died in the hospital. In addition, four prisoners were injured. According to official reports, the attackers were eliminated and the staff involved in the assault were not injured. So a couple more photos. We saw this one earlier, but here's another picture of them walking around here, which uh, I believe is inside of the facility at the time. Got another picture of the uh, Russian special forces getting set up and preparing to... Uh, invade into this facility and take out the attackers and then one more video to show you it's like three seconds i think so just a quick uh, five second clip there actually of uh, the russian special forces preparing to invade into this building and take out uh these terrorists who took control of this prison so again very very crazy news guys just wanted to share some of these details coming out here for you so we've now got this report from Anton Gerashenko reports Russians have damaged one of the two power lines powering the occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The station is on the verge of a blackout, Energo Atom said. Degradation of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which has been under Russian occupation since March 4, 2022, is deepening. On Thursday, August 22nd, due to Russian shelling, there was damage to the external overhead line. 330 kilovolt Zaporizhia thermal power plant, Ferrosplavna. Through it, the temporarily occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant received power for the Ukrainian energy system to meet its needs, the energy sector said. Currently, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is connected to the Ukrainian energy system with only one power line, the VL750 kilovolt Dniprovska. Uh, in case of its damage in an emergency situation, will arise due to the loss of external power supply to the pumps that cool the reactor cores and fuel storage pools of, of uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Nergo Atom said. Uh, since the start of the Russian occupation, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has already experienced eight full blackouts and one partial blackout. With the launch of emergency diesel generators and safety systems, their failure may result in an emergency situation, power energy, uh, engineers emphasized. Okay, so... Obviously, a major security situation here at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant where due to Russian shelling eventually, there was damage to the external overhead line that was powering this nuclear power plant. Okay, so obviously, if this place loses power, the pumps that cool the reactor cores could uh, uh, essentially stop and we could have an overheating of this facility in a major nuclear event. So I've been talking a lot about these nuclear power plants. We have the one up in the Kerch in Kerchatov in the Kursk region, and now this one down here in Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Lots of major risks here to uh, a nuclear event that could take place if one of these uh, one of these nuclear power plants are attacked, or maybe we have an explosion here or something like that. So definitely very scary what we're starting to see here that there was damage to. Uh, a power line that ran to this nuclear uh, facility, okay, or nuclear power plant, excuse me. 
Also, we have this report from Bliskovka. Power engineers have restored uh, Zafaritsia nuclear power plant's connection to one of the power lines damaged by the occupiers, says Yukonergo. The 330 kilovolt high voltage overhead, overhead line is now operational. So thankfully and luckily, they were able to get the power back online at this facility because obviously we could have a major, major issue if the power was completely cut to the Zafaritsia nuclear power plant. So that was something big that happened here in the last 24 hours. Thankfully, they were able to get that back online. So now we're going to switch gears over to the Rostov region and talk about Proletarsk, this town of that has the uh, Kavkaz oil refinery or oil depot that came under attack last Saturday. Okay, It's been almost an entire week. This thing is still burning. It came under attack again by drones, which we'll report on in just a minute. It says here, Tendar, Russian media reports that the burning oil Oil depot of Proletarsk has been hit again by Ukrainian forces. The fire, the fire is now close to spread to kerosene tanks. Okay, so I heard that the kerosene tanks may have blown up at this facility because we now have the fire start to spread outside of the oil depot. So this place is going to be completely destroyed by the time this fire is done. And like I said, it's been burning almost an entire week now. So take a look at this video. I don't know if we'll watch all of it, but I'll show some of it to you guys. We've got this thing still on fire today after it got hit again by Ukrainian drones in the last 24 hours. What's good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bye. Oh, All right, so pretty crazy, right? I mean, look at that flame. Looks like another... Uh, another one of those oil storage tanks probably just blew up right now, and that's why we're seeing this fire go up so big right now. So absolutely massive hit here at this oil depot, and again, it came under attack once again. So it looks like Ukraine is trying to completely destroy this thing. I wouldn't be surprised they'll probably attack it again here in the next couple days. So Ukraine has been very successful at destroying this thing, and it looks like the fire department there basically can't do anything about it. All they can do is just sit back and watch it burn. Okay, so also... We've got this report from Anna Komsa. In Russia, owners of oil depots began trying to sell them in mass. After the attack on the oil depot in Proletarsk, several ads for sales appeared at once. The region is also trying to sell two oil refineries and an oil depot, which is currently not operating. Okay, yeah, why would you want to own an oil depot in this region where it could be struck so easily by Ukrainian drones? Uh, they obviously want to get out now before these... Oil refineries get struck again and destroyed if they haven't already been destroyed or attacked. So um, obviously, yeah, the Russians cannot stop these drone attacks from hitting all these oil depots, especially in the Rostov region. We've been reporting numerous oil depots coming under attack in the Rostov region. So definitely the owners of these oil depots and refineries are very, very scared. So also, next to reports in Rostov, Proletarsk, where an oil depot burns for the sixth day, from drone strikes, the fire has moved into the city. A local resident filmed a large train with fuel tanks driving near the open flames. So this was very recent when this came out, probably about an hour or so at the time that I record this. So this just came out today, August 23rd as well, 2024. So take a look at this. Pretty crazy. <laughs> So definitely this fire is getting out of control as we can see and starting to spread beyond that oil depot and uh, looks like these trains are willing to take the risk and drive right by this fire even with these uh, these oil tanks on the back of this train. So very, very, very crazy news guys. I mean definitely Russia has taken some massive, massive blows here in the last maybe three days and uh, it's just crazy to see the amount of damage that is, that is being taken place here in Russia. So also, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Chinese for a minute. DD Geopolitics reports a military delegation from the People's Liberation Army Ground Forces of China has arrived in Moscow to discuss issues of military cooperation. Chess pieces are moving. So we, we've got the Chinese now heading to Moscow uh, to, to work on military ties and strengthening them. So go ahead and take a look at this as well.
сегодня отношения между нашими странами находятся на беспрецедентно высоком уровне. Еще раз благодарю вас за ваш визит. Надеюсь, что он будет очень позитивным. Okay, so we could definitely see from this video that uh, China is definitely trying to work on strengthening their military ties with Russia. We've been seeing this over the last maybe six months that China is definitely cooperating more and more with Russia. And that's why it says chess pieces are moving here. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep moving. Also from BRICS News, China warns its citizens not to travel to Ukraine, citing high risk of Russian airstrike attacks. Okay, so we reported yesterday from the uh, U.S. Embassy out of Ukraine telling uh, U.S. citizens to get out of the country and start leaving now while they can because Ukraine is going to be coming under heavy attack from the Russians very soon. Considering that they launched this Kursk offensive, we're expecting Russia to retaliate heavily at some point. So even China calling on their citizens to leave now while they can. So take a look at this as well from Anton Gurishenko, Russian propagandist Mardon. We're at war with our enemy, Ukraine. We want to destroy it. We want to dismantle it so that uh, that there's just debris or debris. Excuse me. That's for anyone who who still thinks Russia wants negotiations. Okay, so once again, Russia State TV coming out big and saying they want to destroy Ukraine and raise it to the ground. Basically, take a look at this. Есть страна, которая называется Украина. Это враг. С ней идет война. Мы ее хотим уничтожить. Мы ее хотим разобрать на запчасти. До состояния трухи. Какая там может быть государственная граница? О чем вы? Это они должны беспокоиться о ДРГ. Это они должны беспокоиться о том, что у них взрываются снаряды. Ну, не сейчас, но через какое-то время я на это очень рассчитываю. Есть. Okay, so pretty big again, right? I mean, we continuously see Russian state TV coming out, making very, very big and provocative statements, threats towards Ukraine. And as he said here, we want to dismantle it so that there's just debris. Okay, so they want to basically raise Ukraine to the ground and destroy it. And we know that this is basically Russia's goal. At some point, they want to destroy Ukraine. Now, do they want to level it to the ground? Uh, potentially, I mean, we see that heavily on the eastern side of Ukraine when it comes to Russia invading. They've completely leveled uh, numerous towns on the eastern side of Ukraine. Uh, but when it comes to taking it over, um, obviously, it seems like they want to potentially absorb it back into Russia. I'm sure that's a major goal for Vladimir Putin. And uh, the Kremlin's come out many times stating that, that that's their goal is to completely destroy Ukraine. So we're seeing that again from Russian uh, propagandists on their uh, state TV. OK, so also... From Vanya, Kamala Harris, I'll help mobilize a global response over 50 countries to defend against Putin's aggression. As president, I will stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. USA-Ukraine alliance will be stronger. Okay, so we've got Kamala Harris coming out and openly stating that she will uh, mobilize a global response over 50 countries to help defend against Putin's aggression. And she says that she will be strong and stand with Ukraine Till the very end is basically what she's saying here, okay? So uh, this is why I mentioned earlier, depending on how the elections go, it could be a completely different outcome. We could definitely see the war in Ukraine continue. And I think if Kamala Harris ends up winning, we are definitely going to see this war continue in Ukraine against Russia. So take a look at this. Trump, on the other hand, threatened to abandon NATO. He encouraged Putin to invade our allies said Russia could, quote, do whatever the hell they want. Five days before Russia attacked Ukraine, I met with President Zelensky to warn him about Russia's plan to invade. I helped mobilize a global response over 50 countries to defend against Putin's aggression. As president, I will stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. Trump on the... Okay, so there you go. Kamala Harris coming out and openly stating she will stand with Ukraine 
and help them defend themselves and basically defeat Russia, okay? So we know that if Kamala Harris ends up getting elected in the uh, U.S. elections coming up in November, that most likely this war is going to continue with Ukraine. So if Kamala Harris gets elected, the war is most likely going to continue. If Donald Trump ends up getting elected, we may see this war come to an end or at the bare minimum, heavy pressure being put on Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, to end this war, okay? So it's going to be very uh, polar opposite depending on which president we end up getting in the United States coming up very soon. Okay, a few more things to share with you guys. Appreciate your patience. Next to reports, Russia's leadership has decided to respond to the AFU sortie in the Kursk region, and Kiev expects severe punishment. Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Anatov, uh, Antonov, excuse me, has said, I tell you sincerely that the president has made a decision. I am firmly convinced that everyone will be severely punished for what happened in the Kursk region, Antonov told reporters. Okay, so what we're hearing now is that Russian President Vladimir Putin has made a decision on how they're going to respond, and that's why I told you guys yesterday the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine in Kiev coming out and saying that they need that American citizens need to get out of Ukraine now while they can because they're about to get smashed. Uh, civilian infrastructure is going to be targeted. Government facilities are going to be targeted. And Russia is going to go ham on Ukraine at some point very soon to get payback and revenge for the uh, incursion into the Kursk region. Okay, so I saw I thought that was absolutely huge news coming out. Also from Def Mon. This might possibly be the 56 Guards Air Assault Regiment on their way to reinforce the Kursk region. So we've got a Russian citizen driving through, uh, which what may be the Kursk region or maybe Belgorod, somewhere near the Kursk region, showing lots of uh, logistical trucks and tanks on the back of them heading over to what could be the Kursk region. Take a look at this. All right, my apologies if that was a little loud there towards the beginning. It seems to be a very loud video. But yeah, as we can see here, lots of tanks on the back of these trucks being transported, uh, which I would believe is probably going to the Kursk region. Uh, we also saw a uh, a backhoe right there too, so probably dig some trenches. So um, yeah, lots of military equipment starting to head over to the Kursk region. And we also know that Vladimir Putin was just in Chechnya just the other day as well, meeting with Katerov. And we heard that they had something like 47,000 trained troops that were ready to be deployed whenever Vladimir Putin gives the order uh, that Chechnyan soldiers were going to be heading over to the Kursk region to uh, fight against the Ukrainians and uh, up in that area near Sutsa and all that. So very, very crazy news. A couple more things to share with you. Noah reports a HIMARS strike with a clustered projectile hit a Russian military training ground in the Zaporizhia region where Russian assault groups were training. The attack reportedly resulted in casualties, both killed and wounded, and destroyed military vehicles. The strike was guided by aerial reconnaissance from the 422nd UAV Battalion of the 129th Territorial Defense Brigade. So we got a picture that was released here. We can clearly see this cluster munition that was deployed, which, uh, from what we're told, is in the Zaporizhia region at a training ground where the Russians were training and uh, was definitely hit by HIMARS cluster munitions. So definitely we have confirmation that HIMARS can be fitted with uh, with cluster munitions as well, not just the attack them. So uh, definitely some big news right there. Also, Military News UA reporting the Biden administration will send about $125 million in new military aid to Ukraine, reports AP. Munitions for HIMARS, javelins and anti-armor missiles, Counter drone and counter EW, which is electronic warfare systems, 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter artillery ammunition, vehicles, and other equipment. So this, uh, we heard about this a few days ago. Anthony Blinken was reporting that there was going to be a new military package going to Ukraine. Now we know it's 125 million again going to Ukraine with multiple uh, arms and equipment heading over to support the Ukrainians. Also, one last thing in regards to the eastern side of Ukraine and the Donetsk region. I wanted to share this with you. This came out yesterday from War Mapper, Ukraine Map Weekly Update. Once again, despite operations in Kursk, the advance, the Russian advance along the rail line between Avdivka and, Pro and Prokrovsk has not slowed. 
Sarhivka, Orlivka, Zilan, and Navazilan fell under Russian control with Zorovka and Mikolaivka now contested. Okay, so take a look at this map. They are getting dangerously close to Pokrovsk, and we've been talking about this a lot lately. The Russians are about to take over this town of Novorodivka. Once they take that over, that's pretty much one of the last major settlements before they're able to move to Pokrovsk, okay? So although the Ukrainians are pushing in the Kursk region, they're taking over lots of territory, um, we are continuing to see the Russians taking over more and more territory in the Donetsk region on the eastern side of Ukraine. So I don't know if this whole offensive with the Kursk region was really the best idea. I mean, I think maybe they are going to utilize that uh, for negotiations moving forward. Maybe they'll give up some of that land on the eastern side, the Russians will, to obtain the Kursk region land that's been taken currently. Maybe that could be the case in the future, but uh, you know, respectfully, what we are seeing is the Russians are continuing to push on the eastern side of Ukraine, and they are taking over more land, okay? So I don't know if this offensive was the best idea, and maybe it will turn out to help out the Ukrainians in the end, or maybe it won't. We'll have to see. But regardless, the Russians are getting very close to Pokrovsk, which is a major town uh, that is a key town as well for the Ukrainians to hold on to, and they're holding on for dear life right now. So that's going to be it for today's update, guys. I hope you got something out of this. If you did, please smash that like button. Also, if you enjoy my content, please consider subscribing down below. Hit the notification bell. That way YouTube can notify you with that. Hope you all have a great day. Everybody take care. God bless, and we'll see you in the next one.